up a little bit, John, page 193 in your hymnals. You may have the joy bells, page 193. You may have the joy bells ringing in your heart And a peace that from you never will depart Walk the straight and narrow way Live for Jesus every day He will keep the joy bells ringing in your heart Joy bells ringing in your heart Joy bells ringing in your heart. Take the Savior here below, with you everywhere you go. He will keep the joy bells ringing in your heart. Love of Jesus in its fullness you may know. And this love to those around you sweetly show. Words of kindness always say, deeds of mercy do each day. Then he'll keep the joy bells ringing in your heart. Joy bells ringing in your heart. Joy bells ringing in your heart. Take the Savior here below, with you everywhere you go. Then he'll keep the joy bells ringing in your heart. Sing that last verse. Let your life speak well of Jesus every day. Own his right to every service you can pay. Sinners you can help to win. If your life is pure and clean, and you keep the joy bells ringing in your heart. Joy bells ringing in your heart. Joy bells ringing in your heart. Take the Savior here below, with you everywhere you go. And you keep the joy bells ringing in your heart. Amen. Page 192. Ring the bells of heaven. Just one page over. Ring the bells of heaven. There is joy today. For a soul returning from the wild See the Father meets him out upon the way Welcoming his weary wandering child Glory, glory, how the angels sing Glory, glory, how the loud hearts ring is the ransom army like a mighty sea healing forth the anthem of the free ring the bells of heaven there is joy today for the wonder now is reconciled yes the soul is rescued from his sinful way and is born anew a ransom child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud hearts ring. Tis the ransom army like a mighty sea, healing forth the anthem of the free. Ring the bells of heaven, spread the peace today. Angels swell the glad triumphant strain. Tell the joyful tidings, bear it far away. For a precious soul is born again. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory. Glory, how the loud hearts ring. Tis 
the ransom for me, like a mighty sea, filling forth the anthem of the free. Amen. Good singing this morning. It's reading from Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which hath made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He, will, he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forward and even forevermore. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house this day. Thank you for your precious indwelling Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. That's without error. Meet with us today as the, your word is proclaimed. Be with the messenger. And dear Lord, take the message and apply it to all of our hearts. Dear Lord, let us seek wisdom from on above and have a greater burden for the souls around us as we tell them of Christ. We'd ask for wisdom in telling the witness. We ask, dear Lord, you guide, direct, and bless. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me again. Turn to page 173. Love lifted me. Yes. Aren't you glad for the love of Jesus? Yes. Page 173. Love lifted me. Sing it out. Sing it loud. Is anybody tired this morning? Anybody tired? Oh, we got one honest person back there. A couple. Here we go. Well, wake yourself up by singing. Page 173. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep I stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I, love lifted me. Love lifted me When nothing else could help 
Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I plead. In His blessed presence live, ever His praise to sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. Your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. Why not sing another song about our love to Jesus right there, 174. My Jesus, I love thee. I hope you can sing this out because you really love Jesus today. My Jesus, I love thee. Sing this out as we get ready to hear God's word. Page 174. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. is now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for where is now a love the in life of love the in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and say when the day i 
in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis Turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus in chapter 36. Exodus 36. There are a lot of pages turning. That's good. I'm glad. Exodus chapter 36, and we'll start reading in verse number 1. Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary according to all that the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up, to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering, which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary, to make it with all. And they brought yet unto him free, will, free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the power of your word, the effectiveness of your word even today. Lord, it's still true, it's still real, and it's still alive, and we're so thankful for that. And this morning, as we take time to focus in on your word, I pray that we would be able to uh, come to you with a tender heart, with a ready heart to receive what you have for us. I pray that you would use me as you see fit this morning. Lord, I need to be moved out of the way. I need to be uh, just the instrument that you're using here this morning. And so I pray that you would accomplish that, and that your name would be lifted up in all that we say and do. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. After our special, our junior church is dismissed. brighter the light shines. I'm walking with Jesus, the light of the world. Yes, He is the light. In Him is no darkness. The darker the night, the brighter the light. When I walk with Him, the night may be dark. But why fear the darkness? I'm walking with Jesus, the light of the world. Yes, Christ is my guide. He walks by my side. The sorrow abounds and darkness surrounds. In Him I'll confide. The darker the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. I'm walking with Jesus, walking with the light of the world. He is the light, he is the light. in him is no darkness. The darker the night, the brighter the light, when I walk with him. Look at 
is dark, but bright is the outlook. I lift my eyes upward, and there is the light. He says, don't despair, cast on me your care. The forces of night just can't stand the light when Jesus is there. The darker the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. I'm walking with Jesus, with the light of the world. He is the light, he is the light and him is no darkness. The darker the night, the brighter the light, when I walk with him. The brighter the light when I walk with him. With him. Good job, ladies. Thank you, ladies. Enjoyed that song. The uh, Sometimes you can be distracted by a beautiful harmony and miss the words. Hopefully you heard the words. Uh, what a wonderful uh, song and a great job uh, on that song. We come to a portion of Scripture that to me is a very interesting time in Israel. They are, they are uh, headed to the promised land. And let's forget for just a minute what we know about what happens when they get there. Uh, God is preparing them and God is doing some great things among them as they travel. Uh, they may complain, they may gripe, but they're still God's people. And uh, God was still doing something great, not only for them, but God was doing something, I believe, in them. And that's really what I want to look at uh, here this morning. In, uh, in verses 6 and 7, we find a, a very interesting statement. And we find a, a, a great problem, a, a wonderful problem, that every pastor of every church across the whole world wishes they had. Because they were bringing an offering, and I'll get to the offering here in just a minute, but they're bringing an offering, and as you get down, especially to verse number 7, it explains it this way, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. Could you ever imagine a preacher saying, you know what, y'all just don't need to give anymore. We just got so much money, it's just coming out our ears, and we don't even know what to do with all of it. But that's kind of where we find the, 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 the people here, they, they gave, but they got to this place, and we'll see what the result of that was here in just a little bit in the last chapter of the book of Exodus. But it's an amazing thing that happened to them that they were that it was it wasn't just that God, as I said earlier, it wasn't just that God was doing something for them. God was doing something in them, and God was was softening their heart, I believe, and changing them uh, through uh, through all of this. So again, as I said earlier, the people are are headed to the promised land, and and God is leading them, and they have already experienced some amazing amazing things. They left Egypt, they crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground, and not even not 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 even a day or two later, they're sitting there saying, "Why did you bring us out here to die? Because we're thirsty and we have nothing to drink." And what does God do? God provides. A couple days pass and they say, we're going to starve to death out here. We need some food. And so what does God do? Well, God starts giving them manna from heaven. Every time you turn around, God just keeps on providing and God keeps on blessing these people and keeps on giving them everything that they need. And I believe in this place, in this passage here, he continues to do the same thing to give them that. But what they needed in this passage was they need to be changed. They needed to, be, they needed to be, be, be approached with something or have something put in front of them that was different than all of the things that they had faced up to this point. And it was, it was this. You see, Moses goes up this mountain, and, and he goes up this mountain twice, but the second time he goes up, God gives him the same instructions, and God tells him some, some, some wonderful things. He says, I want you to build a tabernacle, and that's the place where I'm going to dwell. I want you to go, and I want you to build it. And God goes and gives him some very specific details on how to build this tabernacle. We'll look at some of those here in just a little bit. But he gives all of these details for what needs to be done. And he comes down and tells the people that we've got to do this. We're supposed to be doing it. But there is a, there's a phrase that, that is repeated. Actually, there's two phrases, and that's really what we're going to look at uh, in, in this passage here. It's, it's this, it's that their hearts were stirred and they had a willing heart. You find this several times in this passage and in the, in the previous chapter, which we'll look at, 
that they, their hearts were stirred and they had a willing heart. So first of all, let's look at the fact that their hearts were stirred. In verse number 21 of the previous chapter, chapter 35 there, it says, And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for, uh, for the holy garments. It tells us there that every one whose heart stirred him up. The idea of the stirred heart there, it means to be moved, to be agitated, or to be put into action to be stirred. And can I say that one of the things that we're lacking today uh, you know, amongst Christians, it is a stirred heart, a heart that is provoked to action, a heart that says we've got to go and we've got to conquer. We've got to go and we've got to achieve. We've got to go and we've got to do because they see the vision of what God, God wants to do. So Moses has to explain to them all of this in the previous verses. He explains to them what's going on, that, that, that there's going to be this tabernacle, this, this, this tent that is going to be built that they need to look at it and they need to see everything about it, the size of it, every dimension of every piece is described to Moses. And I think that's a wonderful example for you and I to stop and to consider that God does expect much of the believer, but he doesn't expect us to go blindly. He expects a lot from us, but he gives us his word as the guide in our lives. And it gives us, if you will, all the measurements that we need. It gives us all of the things that we need to be able to live in this life successfully for Him and to, bring a, a, and to live a life that is honoring to Him. He lays all of the things out, but He lays all of this out for Moses and He tells them to tell the people uh, of, of all of these things, all the details. Not only that, but how to make them. Not just what they need to be, but how to make them. And this is one of the things as I studied this and it just kind of mesmerized me because I guess I have a simple mind. I don't know that they would take and the Bible tells us they would take gold and they would beat gold down. They were doing a lot of sewing. They were making curtains and, 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 and robes and all kinds of things. And in some of those, there was supposed to be gold thread. Where do you get gold thread from? Well, you get it from gold. They would take gold and they would beat it down to a place where it was just so flat that it was about the size of a thread, and then they would go through and they would cut that to make a thread out of it. Could you imagine the steady hand that you would have to have to be able to do that? I can't even draw a straight line, much less be able to cut something like that. But he, he gives them not just the details of it, but even how to do it. Shows them all of the, the things that are necessary to be able to accomplish. But he also tells them this is a special place. This tabernacle that is being built, it's a special place. Why? Well, number one, it's a place of worship. And that's not the primary thing that we look at, but it's a place of worship. It's a place where they're, they're supposed to go. It's a place of sacrifice for them that they're supposed to bring uh, uh, all of that. But more importantly, it's the place where the glory of the Lord would abide. And as the glory of the Lord would abide there, we'll see here in just a little bit, it is far beyond what they could have ever imagined. But I think in their mind, they're imagining and they're hearing Moses tell them all of these details and about the why we're doing this. But can I tell you this, that they saw the vision. The people saw the vision there in verse number 21 where it says that their hearts were stirred up that they were stirred up because they heard what the vision was. They heard what it was from God and they saw the vision and they said, we've got to go this way. This is great. And they were excited about it. There was a, a, a stirring up that brought, it brought about an action to them. They were agitated to the point of action. How about that? That they would allow themselves to be stirred to that point because of the vision, because of something they had never seen before. They just heard it described to them. And they saw the vision through all of the things that Moses would tell them. But to build something of this nature, you've got to ask one question. Where's all this going to come from? Now, if you were to fast forward in Israel's history and say this is the time, let's say 60 years from now, that they are uh, 70 years from now, that they are settled in the promised land, you could say everybody has all this stuff on hand. I mean, there's plenty of stuff there and we could build this tabernacle. But I want you to keep in mind something here. These people at this point in time are a nomadic people. You know what that means? That means they're traveling. And when you're traveling, you're traveling somewhat light. And so you think of all of the things that needed to be brought, all of the material that needed to be brought. Think of all the gold and the silver. You talk about all of the stones 
uh, that, that, that are, that are uh, told to bring in and they're supposed to be put in the curtains. They're supposed to be put on the robes and all of these things that are supposed to be done. And you think about all of the, the wood, they would use shatim wood in, in almost all of the different things. You think about the Ark of the Covenant, that it was, a built, it was built out of shatim wood and several of the, the, the staves and the different things that they would build. Where in the world are they going to get all of this stuff? While they're a nomadic people, while they're traveling, while they don't have everything that they, they need. Well, they take up an offering that they need to take up. We're going to work our way backwards here just a little bit. In verse number 4 of chapter 35, it says, And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among, from, from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering unto the Lord, gold and silver and brass, and he goes through and talks about all of the things uh, that they would need. He says, we got to take an offering. I don't have all of this, but we're going to have to have an offering. Again, where in the world would a nomadic people get all of this stuff from? I mean, they, you, you remember what the Bible says about when they leave. You can go back a, a, a few chapters here. Go back to chapter 12. When they left, you remember that they left in haste. I mean, it was a quick thing when they left Egypt that... Uh, 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 the, the, the plague, the last plague came and, and the, uh, the firstborn was slain. And all of their firstborn, of course, were, were saved because of the Passover, because of the blood that was put upon the post of their doors. And as it came time for them to leave, they left in a hurry, so much so that the Egyptians just basically pushed them out and said, please get out. We're going to read a few verses here in chapter 12. Look at verse number 33. It says, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. Now, this is not the sermon, but I totally get where they're coming from. If you read the chapters previous and you read about those 10 plagues and all of the things that would happen in those 10 plagues and how overwhelmed uh, all of that must have been for all of them. I mean, what a mess. And, and there's one thing about that, that that I find very interesting about the plagues is that the first three plagues, and again, just a side note, those first three plagues that, 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 were, that were brought, uh, I, I think it's tonight that I'm going to mention this again, but they're brought, brought about, and Pharaoh says, my magicians can do that. If you had frogs everywhere, if you had flies everywhere, why would you want more? I mean, just a simple question. But they did. But then after the third one, that didn't happen anymore. But you go through all of these plagues in that last one. What is their reaction to that? Well, we just read it. They were urgent upon the people. Why? Get out or we're all going to die. I mean, our firstborn are dead. We're probably next. And that's what they're thinking is uh, in all of this. But let's continue reading verse number 34. It says, And the people took their dough. This is the, the, the Hebrews before it was leavened. Their kneading trials being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. This is just one of those things about God that you just have to stop and say, wow. So God knew what was going to go on. God knew that there was going to come a time when a tabernacle needed to be built. And God knew that in order to build that tabernacle, you have to have the material to build that tabernacle and all of the things that need to be. Where did he get all of that stuff from? The people of Israel, when they were leaving Egypt, the Bible tells us that they were, that they were lent. I think that's kind of a funny word because they took it all. And at the end of the verse, verse number 36, what does it say? They spoiled them. What does that mean? Anytime there was a battle, they would go in and they would just take whatever they wanted. And that's the idea here, that they were able to go in and the Egyptians were like, yes, please take everything, just go. Yeah, have you ever been that way? You have people over your house and you just want them to leave? You're like, just take everything. We'll give you all of everything, just go. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We just had folks over to our house recently and they're probably saying, oh, I see. Um, but that's kind of what's going on. They're like, just leave. Take everything. Just leave. Isn't it amazing that there was this offering down the road that was going to be needed and God had already provided what was needed for that offering before the offering was even needed. Isn't that an amazing God? He took care of it. He supplied. And I just kind of use my sanctified imagination for just a minute and I'm thinking, 
of all of these people that left, and maybe a family is sitting there and they're listening to this and they're saying, you know what, I mean, several weeks back we had nothing, but I mean, look at all this gold we have. Well, why don't we give this gold? Why don't we just give everything that we have? Why don't we just give it all to, to this great cause? Now we know why God gave us all of this and to be able to give it all. But why did all of that happen? We already read it there in verse number 21. Their hearts were stirred. Their hearts were stirred. Just in a modern sense, and I'm not preaching about money this morning, but you want to see how somebody's heart is stirred, look at their pocketbook. You want to see somebody's love for the work of the Lord, not my words, Jesus said this, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we will give and we will support those things that we can have that shared vision for because our heart has been stirred. Now, this stirring of the heart, we're not talking about something that is emotion because emotion is something that is up and down. Emotion is something uh, that, that, that uh, uh, wears off. It is something that is produced within, in chapter 35 here, uh, uh, back in our text, chapter 35, Excuse me, in verse number 25 and verse number 26, it says, And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. Why were they doing all of this? Because they were stirred up. Their hearts were stirred up. It was something that they said, there has to be an action to follow up this stirring. There has to be an action that follows up a stirring if it is a genuine stirring. I had a couple of people, a few people approach me after our missions conference and just confide in me and talk to me. God's dealing with me. God's dealing with me about this. And my message to each one of them is don't stand around. <laughs> don't stand around. If it's a true stirring of God, there has to be an action that's going to follow. Otherwise, it's just emotion. Now, I want to ask you to raise your hands here, but, but how many of you have ever made an emotional decision in a church service? I think probably all of us, at least at some point in time, we have done that. What is the end result of that emotional decision? It kind of takes, it sits on the back burner and kind of forget about it for a while. But to have your heart truly stirred by God demands an action. I think of the, the apostles when they were told, you just need to stop speaking in that name. They said, we can't help it. We have to tell everybody about Jesus. That's a heart that's stirred. They can't help it. They just keep moving. A stirred heart. These ladies here would take all of the things brought in and they would just start working because their heart was stirred. They wanted to see the end result. They wanted to see all of these things that is done. A stirred heart. This heart that is truly stirred leads to change. Now, I want to pause for just a second, though. Could you imagine somebody in this assembly roughly, approximately, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of two million people, that in all of those people, that there is somebody that's sitting there listening to Moses and he's explaining everything the way that God explained it to him. Let me just say, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. Now, I don't know that that happened there, but I know the nature of people. And I'm not saying that it did. I'm just saying I know the nature of people. And I've experienced that many times that somebody will try and share a vision with somebody. <sighs> Marriage is wonderful. My wife tries to share visions with me about things she wants to do to the house. And, and by the end of the conversation, I don't even know where I live anymore. It's because we speak different languages, you understand. But there's many times that she's telling me about these things. And, and you know what, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, she's not seeing it. I'm just not seeing it. In a church setting, there can be a vision to move forward and, and goals that are set and a purpose that is planned and, and, and a vision that is cast. And I've seen it way too many times that people just sit back and just say, I'm not seeing it. I don't, I don't really see how that's all going to work. Well, what is that? That's somebody that refuses to allow their heart to be stirred. They don't want to have that stirred heart, probably because they know that it demands an action. Maybe they're just the cantankerous ones, the, the naysayers. It's impossible for us to do this. And they start to take an offering. Hey, we're never going to be able to take that much offering. Or maybe there's the thought of, I've never really done it that way before. 
Now I'll say this about this church. I appreciate this church and in the two and a half years that I've been here has been so gracious and changes that I've made. And there's been some times that people have raised eyebrows and, and said, what? Um, and I understand that. I totally did understand. And I haven't had a whole lot of people telling me, well, we've never done it that way before. And I'm thankful for that. But I sure have been in a lot of settings like that in a church where people will stand up. I was part of a ministry previously where that was really the theme of the ministry, unfortunately. Well, that's not the way the previous pastor did it. I wasn't the pastor, but that's not the way the previous pastor did it. And my response was always, okay. And? <laughs> but there is just a, an attitude of, we've just never done it this way before, so we probably shouldn't do that. Don't, don't let yourself fall into that. Don't, don't let yourself go that way. When things change, when, when there's a vision that is cast, to see that vision for what it's worth and to be stirred up in that. God uses those that will allow their hearts to be served, uh, uh, stirred. Verse number two again of chapter 36, listen to this. It says, and Moses called Bezalel. Bezalel is an interesting character. I actually preached a sermon on him. It's been a while back. But Bezalel is an interesting man. But from the best that I can read in Scripture here, Bezalel is, is if you will, in a, in a human sense, he is the foreman of this construction job. He's the guy that kind of makes sure that everything's being done the way that it's supposed to, but he is also in there doing the work uh, that needs to be done. So think about that. In verse number two again, it says, And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come to, to come unto the work, those last three words, to do it. To do it. You see, there was a stirring there that said, we've got to do the work. It wasn't enough to just know how. We know this by reading the, these two chapters here. Bezalel was a very gifted man. Bezalel could work with several different materials. Uh, uh, he, could work with, uh, he could work with gold. He could work with stone. He could engrave. There were a lot of things that he, was, he could do. He was a jack of all trades. He, he was just a good guy to have there as a construction foreman, if you will. But as he was doing this, it was good that he knew how to do all of this. But he needed to use the gifts that God had given him. He needed to put them into practice. And he wouldn't put those into practice until God stirred his heart and he, was then, he then made the decision, I need to be there. I need to be in the, in the middle of this. They needed that stirred heart. But also we find in that verse and in other verses here that there was also the heart that was willing. It's good to be stirred, but being stirred takes you to the place of being willing. Verse number 22 of chapter 35. It says, And they came both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted. What did they do? They brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets all jewels of gold, and every man that offer, offered offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. This only comes after catching the vision and having your heart stirred, being able to see it and say, that's the way that we need to go. That's the direction we're heading. And then to have a willing heart just to get in there and to get involved for whatever, for however uh, it needs to be done. But to allow our hearts to be stirred takes us to the place of a willingness as we read right here in this verse here, first of all, they were willing to give. They were willing to give. They were, they were willing to financially invest, if you will. But I think when you think about the fact that they were financially investing, were they really financially investing or were they just taking what was given to them by God and giving it back to the Lord? Just a thought when we think about finances, when we think about money. Are y'all with me this morning? All right. Y'all are getting uncomfortable. I haven't even gotten to the mean stuff yet. The willing heart says, I'm willing to give. I'm willing to give everything that I can. I appreciate the heart of many people in our church that have a heart to give, and they will continue to give. And, and I've never had to tell people to stop giving, uh, but there's been some times when I think you're going to work yourself into the poorhouse by giving so much. And I'm thankful for the heart of people that are just willing to give to the work, to whatever the work is that needs to be done. They were willing to give. They gave of their wealth. Look at verse number 29. It says, The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work. God put that heart that said, This is greater than me. Remember where they got this. Remember where the offering came from. That it came from, from the Lord in the first place. That he, 
he caused the Egyptians' hearts to soften to where they just pushed them out and told them to take everything and that they spoiled them. I said it earlier, but I'll just say it again because Jesus said it. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. They were willing to give. But in, in chapter 35, verse number 10, the Bible says, And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded, the tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, and his patches, and his boards, uh, and his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, and goes on and talks about all of that. Those that are wise-hearted, what is that? Those that God has given the knowledge, the know-how, the ability to be able to do all of these things, they were to be there and that God would give them a heart that is willing to give, to work. They are willing to work, willing to give of, of not just a financial, but to give of themselves. And, and then they, they were to give, bring all, all, all of the stuff there for the work there in verse number 29. And everything that was there was supposed to be directed by the hand of Moses, by the leading that God said, this is what you're supposed to be working. They had a willing mind to work. When I think about a willing mind to work, my mind always goes to the people of Israel after their 70 years of captivity, and they went back to Jerusalem, and they started rebuilding the walls, and they started rebuilding the temple. And the book of Nehemiah tells us this, that they were there building the walls, and they, they completed the wall in an amazing amount of time. Why? Because the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. Listen, when there is a vision that is cast for a tabernacle, it's a great vision, and everybody can get behind it and say, man, this is going to be great when it's done. This is going to be wonderful. And pull up their lawn chair and say, man, I'm going to watch this thing go up. It's going to be great. Like my father-in-law always said, I love work. I could sit and watch it all day long. But no, there is a mind to work. Listen, we can get the vision, we can understand the vision, and we can even maybe even like the vision, but if our heart isn't stirred, our heart is not going to be willing not only to give but also to work. There ought to be a willingness to do the work that is around, around the house of God. There's a lot of things around here that need to be done. I think we could all probably agree with that. And as we start working on these things, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you. If it's just me doing it, it ain't going to turn out too good. If it's just me and Brother Michael doing it, it's just going to be a whole lot of work for the two of us. But if the whole church gets behind it, it's amazing how quick things can be accomplished. If everybody says, I can see the vision, my heart is stirred, I want to see God use our church, I want to see God further the gospel through our church, I want to see our church improve, I want to do everything that I can to be able to help this and have a heart that is willing to get in there and to, willing, to be willing to get involved, sacrificially get involved. You know, any time that you come to the church when, when it's not a church time, in my mind, you are sacrificially giving of your time to the Lord. And I'm thankful for that. And I praise the Lord for people that have a heart to do that, to come up and to give of their time. Uh, I, I've said this before, that the most valuable commodity that we, uh, we possess as human beings is time. It's not money. And so to come, and I don't take it lightly when somebody says, I want to work, I want to get involved with something. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm just looking for a place to serve. I'm chomping at the bit. I'm like, man, I'm going to find you a place to serve. Why? Because there's a willing heart. There's a heart that says, I I'm willing to do whatever it is you need me to do. I'm willing to do it. I'm excited about it. I can see the vision as we move forward. When we went to start on this auditorium and we were doing the paint, I'm, I'm going to pick on a group of people here for just a second. There were some people that were not willing hearted. Some of the men in this church who hate painting Worse than I hate cauliflower. And I don't even understand that. But anyway, I'm just gonna I'm just picking on them. But you know what we did have? We had we had a bunch of people that came up. There were some men that came up. I shouldn't put all men in that. Some men that were here while the ladies were here, and we just got to work. They said, I can see your vision, preacher. I don't understand it. It's kind of weird. But I, I, I we we're gonna do it. And there were people that had a mind to work and got it done got the job done. We have to understand when it comes to the house of God, when it comes to the work of the Lord, we've got to have a willing heart to just work, to serve, to do whatever it is that needs to be done to get the job done. I was sharing with uh, uh, one of the men the other day when uh, I, I was in St. Louis and I'd first gotten to St. Louis and uh, God just really used us. We built up a bus route. We were running 50, 60 on, on Sunday morning, and it was awesome. I mean, we were excited. We were fired up. And I went to my preacher. And I said, preacher, we got to have a junior church. we got to do something. You know what my preacher said to me? 
Our preacher looked right at me and he says, it's yours. One thing that I'm not good at, and I was teaching junior church, and I remember thinking there's a whole lot of people that would be a whole lot better, but you know what? God put in me a, a vision to be able to see this has got to be done. I bought into what my pastor said, and I said, we're going to do this. And God blessed it, and we saw kids saved through the bus ministry, through the junior church, through all of those things. It was uncomfortable. I was doing things that I honestly I wasn't comfortable with, and I don't think were some were things that I, I, I even knew what I was doing most of the time. But there was a willingness to work. And in the people here, they had this willingness to work. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 36. It says, Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all the Lord had commanded. You know what I see here? Is that God, before all of this even happened, God prepared all of the finances by spoiling the Egyptians because he knew what was coming ahead. You know what else God did? God equipped the people with the right people that knew how. And that's what you find there in verse number one. They knew how. And God equipped them to be able to come in and to be able to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. Could you imagine that God would tell them, okay, I need you to do all of these things, and I need all of these things to be plated, uh, plated with gold. And everybody's looking around and saying, there's nobody who knows how to do that. There's nobody who knows how to, be, how to plate wood with gold. We, we really don't understand that. Could you imagine that? That would have been a difficult situation. But what happened? God put all of the people there. God put all of the ability, all of the skills. Can I say it this way? God put all of the gifts there all of the gifts to be able to accomplish what he wanted. That's the same thing that he does for the local church. See, in 1 Corinthians, we find, we'll not turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and, and even into verse and, and in chapter 14, you find the, the gifts that there is a breakdown in other passages as well, but there's a breakdown of some of the gifts that God gives. But you find this, that all of those gifts that are given, they're given for a purpose, according to Paul. Why are they given? For the edification of the church, the body of Christ for the success of this. Do you realize that every member of Faith Baptist Church is gifted for the service of Faith Baptist Church? Now how silly would it be for Bezalel to say, I'm gifted in all of these areas, but you know what, I'm going to sit this one out. I'm kind of tired now. <laughs> that would have been kind of silly. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, I agree with myself, that's fine. But what we find then is in the modern setting that God has put gifts in the church, and if you do not use those gifts... You're just saying, I'm just going to sit this one out. God has gifted you. He wants to use you in the local church, but you've got to be willing. God's not going to hold you down by the throat. The preacher's not going to hold you down by the throat, trust me. But there has to be a, a, a willingness to be able to do the work that needs to be done. To use the gifts that God has given. But also there is a willingness here to teach. There is a willingness to teach. Look at verse uh, chapter 35, in, starting in verse number 30. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works, to work in gold and silver, uh, and in brass, and in cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of wood, to make any manner of cunning work. Do you see how God has gifted him, and, and how wonderful the gifts are and, and for, for them at this time? But look at verse 34. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, that they would teach. What are they going to teach? Well, read verses 30 through 33 again, and you're going to see to teach how to do all of these things, to show some people. So, you know, if you just took just one person to do all these jobs, this job was going to take forever. But you know what they did? They taught. They would teach them how to do all of these things, how to do the work of the Lord, how to, how to sow, which is the work of the Lord, how to carve in stone, which is the work of the Lord, how to beat gold down, which is the work of the Lord, how to do all of these things. And they were passing that on. They were trying to teach these, these others that did not know how 
to do it. They were willing to teach them. And I love that the Bible says that, that he put in them a willingness to teach, that they had the desire to put into or to invest in to somebody else. There are always need, there is always a need for those that are willing to teach others. To teach others what it is to be a Christian, to teach others how to be godly. And we find even in Scripture that, that there are the, that the aged men are to teach the younger men, that the aged women are to teach the younger women, that there is a heart that should be there. There, is a, there should be a willingness within us to be able to invest in people that are younger than us, people that maybe are less mature spiritually than us, whatever it may be that we would invest in them and put something into them. That's what we find here with Bezalel and Aholiab, that they had a willing heart to invest in other people, to teach them. And only then would this work get done as quickly as they needed it to get done because there would be much more hands there. I think of the word teacher and the thinking of what a teacher is. And I really like to use a different word. I like to use investor. Investor. Because I know for me, when I teach people, I'm always looking at it as I'm investing. I mean, not like how I would invest money so that I can get a gain. But I'm investing in a person so that God can get a gain through them. To invest in people, to put everything into somebody. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. This is not really the sermon, but one of the problems that I have seen today is in this area that there is a failure in teaching the next generation. And you know what happens to churches who don't teach the next generation? You die. You die. So there has to be a constant mentality of investing of showing the things of God, of encouragement, of help to point in the right direction. You can't make anybody do anything, but you sure can teach them what the right thing is to do and even how to do that. To be able to point them to the Word of God and to be able to let God do that. Teaching is showing how, not showing to. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Let's just um, use for an example tomorrow. Uh, I have shop class for our school, and we're going to change oil. I have no doubt that most of the boys have never, they, they don't even know that there's oil in a car, probably. And so I can go to them, and I can say to them before class, you need to change oil. Here's why. You need to change it every three to 5,000 miles uh, because of the viscosity in the engine is going to end up tearing the engine up. If you don't, it lubricates the engine. You really need that in there. That's something that's very key. If it doesn't, it's going to freeze up because of the, the heat and it's going to die. And then you're going to be out thousands of dollars to buy a new engine because you didn't change the oil. Now, is all of that that I said true? Some of you are like, I don't know. <laughs> it's true. It is true. So get out there and change the oil. Was that really good? Is that really going to help them any? No. You know what's going to help them? And that's why we have shop class, by the way. Because we want to show them how. I want to show you how to change the oil. I want to show you some of the things that you can do wrong when you're changing the oil. I want them to understand all of these things about changing the oil by showing them how. We don't just tell people, you just really need to live by faith. We don't just tell people, you need to learn to trust God. We don't just tell people, you need to, uh, you, you, you need to walk in, in, in accordance with the Scripture. What do we do? We need to show them how. That's teaching. That's teaching. Not just words, but there needs to be an action that is there. It's not enough to just tell somebody, you know what your problem is? You need to walk with God. How about we show somebody what it is to walk with God? How about we show them the how? But in this, if you really think about the verse, as we just read there, there were those that were willing to teach. That means that there were those that were going to be willing to learn. There were those that were going to have to sit and listen to be ready to receive the information. One person in Scripture that fascinates me, and especially in, in the 
uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's not Moses, although Moses does fascinate me. It's Joshua. I love Joshua. Moses goes up the mountain the first time to get the Ten Commandments. You know where Joshua was? He, he was about halfway up the mountain. When the Lord showed himself in the tabernacle to, to Moses, his hinder parts, you know where Joshua was? He's kind of peeking around the corner. And after it was all said and done, he's like, I'm just going to stay here. Good old Joshua. You know why Joshua was so great, I believe? Because Moses and Aaron, I believe as well, invested in Joshua. You know why Timothy was great? Because Paul invested in him. You know why Elisha was, was used twice as much by God as Elijah? Because Elijah invested in Elisha. Listen, we've got to get this mentality of, well, they, they may usurp us. They may end up becoming greater than us. Great. If, if, if we can teach somebody and they become twice the Christian as we are, praise God for that. We ought to be investing, but we ought to have those that are willing to sit and to listen and to say, I don't know everything. Now, that's hard. I remember being 17 years old. Those words weren't even in my vocabulary because I knew everything. But then to get to that place to where I realized I really need to be taught. Now I allowed Brother Orrin Cobb, Brother Russ Bishop, Brother Mike Andrews to invest in me. And I'm just going to be honest with you, I would not be here today were it not for those three men. They invested. But I had to be willing. I had to sit still and I had to listen. I had to take in what was needed to be taken in. They were so willing they were so stirred that they had to be stopped. Isn't that something? They just wanted to give everything. And finally, Bezalel went to, and, and the Holy I went to Moses, and they said, Moses, you got to cut this off. We've just got to, they're just too willing. They're just too stirred up. I, I couldn't imagine saying that as a preacher. I mean, the people are just too willing to serve. The people are just too stirred up for the things of God. But they were that stirred up that they just overflowed with the giving. I want to take you to the end of this, though. Go to the book, uh, or go to the chapter 40, the last chapter of this book. They follow God's design, and as you go through these the chapters in between, you find the, the building and how they did the things and they took care of things and and they did it exactly the way that God said. If something was supposed to be three cubits wide, it was going to be three cubits wide. If it was going to be nine cubits long, they were careful to make sure that it was nine cubits long. If it was supposed to be gold, uh, 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 wood covered in, in, in pure gold, they made sure it was wood covered in pure gold. And they did everything exactly the way that God wanted them to do this. And then I could just imagine chapter 40, you get to the place to where they start setting up this tabernacle and it start coming to, and that vision is being realized and everybody is just starting to see. And I could just imagine the emotion of such an event. They've invested financially. They've invested of their work. And as this is being put up and they see this tabernacle getting put up and they're sitting back and I can just imagine people that are, that are not part of the setup crew. They're, they're watching this going and they're like, it's, it's greater than what we thought. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. But just the satisfaction of being able to see that wasn't the best part about it all. It, it, it wasn't just the satisfaction of a job well done. It wasn't the satisfaction of the beauty of it and how great it was. It wasn't just the satisfaction of saying we did it exactly the way that God said to do it. No, we find a satisfaction of it. If you go down to verse number 34, it says, Then the cloud, they get it all built up, and it says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What an amazing event. It would be great to see all of this happen, but then God showed up. The glory, the Shekinah glory of God came down and it filled this place. It filled this place so much so that Moses couldn't even be in the tabernacle. He had to be outside of the tabernacle. Everybody was pushed out because God was in that place and God was moving and God was working and they were in awe, not because of their workmanship, not because of their obedience. They were in awe because of God and His glory. 
You see, when we follow what God wants and we, and we are willing and we are letting Him stir our hearts up and we are involved in the things that God wants to do and God wants to accomplish, it's not, a, it's not the satisfaction of a job well done or even of our obedience of us doing what it is. The satisfaction is at the end of the day, God is glorified. If there's any other satisfaction, it's temporal and it's temporary and it's worthless. To, to be able at the end of the day, step back and say, Wow. God just showed up. I've shared this with you before, but it really fits this. We were at camp one year, and it was as if uh, our youth group had stone hearts. I mean, we go through Monday night, Tuesday all day, Wednesday all day, and we may have had one or two of our teenagers go down to the altar. I'm thinking, this is not like our youth group. What is the deal? Wednesday night after the service, I called them in. I had three or four counselors, I forget. And I brought them together and I said, man, we need to go pray. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand this, but something, something's wrong. And so we went down to the tabernacle and we prayed, ironically called the tabernacle. We went down there and we got down to that altar and we just started begging God, God, what is going on? God, you've got to move. God, you've got to do something. You've got to, you've got to accomplish your work here. We're wasting our time if you're not working. And we prayed until 2 o'clock, maybe 3 o'clock in the morning. And we were just pouring our hearts out to God. God, you've got to do something. That next day in the, in the, uh, the, the service, you knew it. God showed up. And I remember leaning over to two of those men. And I said, y'all come with me. The camp we're at, the tabernacle's on a hill. So you can go to the back of the tabernacle and you can see everything. I told those men, I said, we're going to the back. Let's just go stand and watch. I'll never forget it. I will never forget it. Our whole youth group ended down at that and ended up down at that altar, crying out to God. Kids giving their lives to God, God doing a work, and we were just standing there in tears. Why? The glory of the Lord. He showed up. It had nothing to do with us, and everything to do with Him. And I remember going back. That was one of the greatest trips back from camp. We, our kids love to burn stuff. Burning stuff with youth groups is awesome. They were burning clothes. They were burning music. They were burning all kinds of stuff that their parents probably didn't know they were burning. And it was awesome. But it was only because God showed up. Here's what I know to be true. When we can let our hearts be stirred, and then we can just be willing, God, whatever, use me. If it's to give, if it's to put into labor, if it's to teach, whatever it is, God, I am willing to do that because our heart is stirred up. Listen, I'm telling you right now, God shows up and his name is glorified. His work is glorified through you. Wow. With your head's bowed and your eyes closed. Number one, is your heart being stirred? Have you been ignoring the stirring of the Spirit of God in your life? Pushing it aside? Maybe saying, I, it's just a feeling, it's just a gut. You know, when the Spirit of God's working, you identify it. It's the Lord trying to stir me up. Maybe you have been stirred, but you haven't got to that place to where you're so stirred that you're just willing to do whatever God wants. I, I surrender, Lord, w whatever you want me to do. I'm here, I'm ready to just go and ready to just do everything that you want. And then just watch God show up. Lord, bless this invitation. You, you have a work that you are accomplishing right now. Lord, I pray that nothing would interfere with that, that there would be a surrendered heart here today uh, that would just come to you and ready. Bless this time, we ask in Christ's name. Stand